ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me today. Um, so I'm Carl Hughes. I'm the engineering manager at Packback Books, a startup here in Chicago. And today I'm going to be talking about an, basically a, a short introduction to object-oriented programming in Ruby and designing good code. Um, so I'm um, doing this tomorrow live in front of a group of students at the Startup Institute. But for now, I'm just recording this for YouTube purposes and anyone who wants to watch live on Google Plus, I suppose. So I'll start with a quick introduction about myself. Um, Pack Pack Books is basically a service that allows students to rent digital textbooks for um, short term, so daily digital textbook rentals. So you pay $5 a day to rent a textbook. Um, maybe it's one that you only use a few times, you don't need it every day. Um, I'm going to increase my screen there. Um, yeah, so that's what Packback Books, Pack Back Books does. Um, $5 every day you want to rent your textbook. Pretty cool idea. Um, and I lead a software development team there. So I graduated from the University of Tennessee back a couple of years ago. Um, and I uh, studied engineering, mechanical engineering actually, and business. Uh, back when I was at UT, I got into software. Um, getting into web stuff. So I did a couple internships in mechanical engineering with some big companies that I didn't find especially exciting and so I taught myself to do basic web development PHP and uh, from there I uh, kind of got started building this blogging platform for college students um, at my school to use and then eventually I got noticed by another startup that was founded back in 2006 and they hired me on in 2011 to start building a news branch. So uloop.com is a big classified ads platform for college students. You can find housing, jobs, um, lots of things like that. Um, and uh, in addition, what they wanted to do was add a way for students to find out what's going on in their university. So I worked with a team, or built up a team of about 500 writers at colleges around the country and uh, built the back end and front end um, software that allowed them to manage all this content that was coming in. We had um, at one point 10, 20 articles a day coming in and so uh, we used to customize WordPress which is a PHP open source platform for um, managing all their content, giving them rewards, uh, keeping up with how much tra traffic each, of, each one of them brought in, um, things like that. So it's a, a about 50% code and development, and about 50% managing the groups of writers and organizing and keeping uh, hiring editors and things like that. Then in 2013, uh, at the end of the year, I got hired on, decided to move to Packback, which is where I am now. And uh, basically, Packback had just received their first round of funding, and they were looking to um, expand and uh, basically improve their product offering. Uh, they're, they have an e-reader, uh, they have a whole search um, and catalog, product catalog, um, import tools. I mean, there's a lot going on with Packback and what we have going on now, so I'll leave those out till later. <clears throat> but the uh, big thing I'm kind of promoting here today is that we are going to be on Shark Tank, which is pretty exciting news. Um, it's a TV show where... Um, Mark Cuban and a couple other uh, hosts basically listen to your pitch and then they offer you money if you're good enough and if you're not, you just get to be on the show and that's cool. So we're going to be on there March 21st. Our episode is airing. Uh, if you want to come view it with me and the rest of the Packback team, we're going to be in 1871, which is in Merchandise Mart on the 12th floor in Chicago at 7 p.m. Uh, and you are all, everyone is welcome to come, um, even if you don't register for the event. We have an event, right? Just show up. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to see a ton of traffic on the site, and um, yeah, it'll be great. So today I'm talking about code design, and um, there are a couple things I want to say before we really start, and the first is I want to give you a warning that working with a startup in code development is very different from working at a big company in code development. In a startup, your priorities are getting things out fast and getting them working well enough that users won't just hate you for produce or for pushing those code uh, changes to production. Whereas in a big company, there's a lot more testing, there's a lot more of a rigid environment, and that's good. I mean, honestly, 
developers, it can be tough and stressful working in a startup environment because you're gonna you're gonna push code that has bugs and you know it has bugs. Um, so everything I tell you here, keep in mind that I'm a startup developer. I've always worked with small teams of one to five people. I um, I guess that's um, that means my goals and my objectives have always been very different from someone who worked at say a Microsoft or something like that. Today. What I really want to help you do is avoid some of the very rookie mistakes that I went through back when I was first learning on my own, and I want to help you learn to solve problems. So the basic things we're going to go over today are the terminology behind object-oriented programming. We're going to learn a little bit about how to plan code better before you actually execute and start writing. This is one thing that new developers tend to do poorly and tend to uh, really have uh, difficulty with, but basically you always want to have an idea of where you're going before you start writing code. We're going to look at some examples of mostly bad <clears throat> code design and how you can avoid those, and then we're going to do a hands-on coding session. So what is object-oriented programming? Um, basically, it's a way of organizing code that uses objects to represent things, and then it awards them different attributes and unique features to manipulate their characteristics. Now that in itself, <clears throat> probably doesn't mean a lot to you. Hmm. Sorry, getting a drink there. But as we go over the individual pieces of a class and of an object, um, you're going to kind of see more clearly what this means. So the two first terms we're going to introduce are classes and objects. A class is the basic terms, rules, and methods that shape or define an object, while an object is the concrete instance of a class. So you can have a lot of objects that have very different attributes, but they all start from the same class. For example, and this is what I'm showing in the picture here, birds. <clears throat> There's a single class of birds. I mean, that's a very broad term, right? Um, there are two cans, there are pigeons, there are penguins, there are ducks. These are all of the class birds, but individually they have very different characteristics. So some of these birds, they can fly. Um, some of them can make beautiful noises. Some of them shit on your car. Either way, each one is still belongs to the class bird, but each instance of the bird, which is an object, is very different. <clears throat> the next term we're going to define are variables which in object-oriented programming, a big part of what makes variables unique and usable is their scope. And so a variable in general will define or construct certain attributes that are attached to an object, uh, in a class as a whole, an individual block within a program, or even your program as a whole. So we have a few different kinds of variables uh, that you should kind of know about. The first uh, and once again, we're in Ruby here, so any examples are going to be different depending on what language you're using. But uh, the first kind of variable we're going to talk about is this double at number of customers equals zero. Now, anytime in Ruby when you have a class and you, you define at at number of customers equals zero, it means this variable will be the same for any instance of this class. <clears throat> this is a class-wide variable meaning that you set up two different objects that use this same class, two different, for example, kinds of birds that both are birds, they still get this class-wide object. The next kind of variable we're going to talk about are local variables, which are specific to a certain block of code. So this next uh, line you see here is def initialize. Now this is a function, we'll get into functions in a second, but basically <clears throat> what it does is it takes three inputs. ID, name, and address, ADDR, I'm assuming that's address. Uh, and then in the next lines, these are ID, name, and address, these are local variables. It can only be used within this function, this block of code. But we set at cust ID equals ID. Now when we have a single at sign in front of a variable name, what that means is it can be used within this object or this instance of a class. So every customer, like this class is called customer, will have its own customer ID that is set right here and doesn't change. Same with the name and the address. Now it can change later based on another function, but the idea is 
when we initialize uh, with local variables, we then set them equal to object um, or instance variables. Um, and those can be used later in other functions. You'll see, oh god, sorry, I'm rolling through things too quickly here. Um, so you'll see in the next function, display details, <clears throat> this puts, which means output, customer ID, and then cust ID, which is a instance-wide variable. So depending on which customer we're talking about here, we're going to get different output. Um, so we'll get into more specific um, examples of that. The next thing we're going to talk about are functions or methods. I'm going to use these words interchangeably, but the purposes of Ruby are basically interchangeable. And that, in general with Ruby, what you're going to do is you're going to use def to define flies, which is the method name or function name. So what this does is, within the class bird, we can now call a function called flies. And it's going to return some output. So in general, a function or a method is part of a class that takes inputs, or it may not take inputs. It performs some manipulation. And then it either returns an output or changes some variable or some object uh, or some you know, term in the database or something. Um, basically, in the most broad sense, they're used for manipulating objects. So you'll see at the end, we're going to get into something a little more interesting here. Duck equals bird.new. Now, bird.new, what that means in Ruby is we set a new object of the bird class up, and we call it duck. So that means that now that we've set this uh, object up, we're able to call any of the variables or uh, methods that are defined within that class. So the next line we have is puts <coughs> duck.flies. What this means is let's take our duck object that is of the bird class that we defined above and let's run the method flies. And now we have flies. If wings equals two, which let's go back this is a class-wide variable, meaning all bird objects are going this, they will get this variable. Wings is two, and it will return true. <coughs> now, we'll never return false. Um, I mean, this is a small little simple program to show you, but we have an else condition that says return false. So if some other method defined wings to be be something different, we call that method first, we might return false. We'll get into to kind of how that works in a minute. Encapsulation is another uh, important concept in object-oriented programming. And basically, object-oriented programming allows us to set rules about where our classes, methods, and variables can be accessed. We can allow some elements to be called from outside the class and others to only be called within the class. This is important for security purposes, um, but also for kind of keeping your um, your code sort of, uh, I guess, organized well. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to have a private uh, method. Um, and so we set up our class bird. We have our wings uh, variable here that is class-wide true. Then we have a method that's public because there's nothing in front of it saying it's private or otherwise, and it's called flies, once again. But this time, flies doesn't actually perform any logic. What it does is it just calls the function get wings. Now there's a, a tag here called private. So that means the next functions that we have are going to be private to this class, meaning only this class can call them. So we define this ne next method, get wings, and we, we now have moved all of our logic from the flies uh, method into the get wings method. And it does the exact same thing. If wings equals two, return true, else return false. Now let's look at what happens when we set up a new bird, and we're going to call it duck, and then we output duck flies. It's going to output true, because what it does is it calls in the bird class the flies method, and it outputs the, whatever comes from calling the get wings method. The get wings method will return true. But if we say puts output once again duck dot get wings, there's going to be an error, and the reason for this is that we've made get wings private, meaning it can only be accessed within this class, 
So this call to get wings outside of the class, where after the class has ended, will fail. This is useful for, say, you want to sanitize some kind of database input. Um, I, would, I don't want a user to actually be able to write immediately to a database. What I want them to do is call a function that sanitizes input, then calls another function <coughs> that writes to the database. Um, this prevents users from, or another programmer, or from accidentally um, doing something that would harm his own site. You'll see a lot of this in Ruby uh, on Rails, uh, which I think is what you guys at Startup Institute are focused on. But uh, this gives you kind of a basic idea of what the idea, uh, the concept of encapsulation is. The next thing we're going to talk about is inheritance. So up until now, we've had one class called Bird, and it kind of did everything for us. But what if we have we want to define further a different kind of bird? So for example, a penguin is a kind of bird, but it's not the only kind. But we do want a penguin to sort of have all the basic attributes that all birds do. So in our class of bird, we have uh, we have set this variable that's class-wide to two. We have set a function called flies to true. Um, and then when we have a class that is penguin, that's a subclass, and that's what that less than sign means, a bird, it automatically gets everything that bird has, but it also can define its own methods that are more specific. So for example, with a penguin, they don't fly. So we're going to redefine, we're going to kind of rewrite the flies method that we wrote above in the bird class. And we're going to say, this time it's false. Same with, uh, we're going to also add a new function for penguins alone, where we can get their wing count. And all that will do is out or send back the number of wings that we defined originally in the bird class. But because the penguin class is a subclass, it will also get access to that class-wide variable. So when we set up a new penguin, and we output penguin flies, it's going to output false because we redefine flies for the penguin type of bird. Next, if we call wing count, it's going to output two because we defined wings to be equal to two in the bird class, and that gets inherited by the penguin class. So <clears throat> using this, you can write a very general class that can then be, uh, basically those attributes can be rewritten or inherited by subclasses. The next term we're going to talk about is very closely related, and that's called polymorphism, which basically means that you can have multiple subclasses with the same master class or parent class. So um, inheritance uh, allows us to um, initiate different instances of subclass that all have different attributes than other instances, uh, depending on which subclass they belong to. So Penguin is a kind of bird, and we define flies to false. We define wing count to wings, just like we did before. We didn't change our bird uh, class either, by the way. And then we have another class of birds called duck. And for ducks, they get one new thing, which is swims true. Now, penguin doesn't have anything about swims, so we couldn't call uh, penguins.swims. Uh, it, would, it would error out on us. So... Um, down here, we kind of see an example of this. Penguin, um, we say new penguin, we output the flies uh, method, and it's going to give us false, as we expect. Then we have a new duck that we output the fly method, and because the duck subclass never changed what was originally in the bird class, <clears throat> it's going to output true, because that was defined in the bird class, as we saw here. Class bird, define flies, true. Um, but then we also can, from the duck class, call swims, which allows us to um, output true there. Now, if we call, once again, from penguin.swims, we would get an error because penguin doesn't have a method called swims. So both of these have imported a, the basics of their class from the parent class. Then the subclasses have new things that they can add on to it or they can rewrite things from the old class. That's the idea of polymorphism. The next idea we're going to talk about is chaining methods together. <clears throat> so this is done a lot in Rails. It's important in a lot in other Ruby libraries, so it's important you kind of have an idea of how it works. 
let's go through this line by line. This is a little complicated, but we have a class called bird. We have a method here at the beginning called initialize. Now, initialize is a special method in Ruby. What this does is anytime you call, um, you, you set up a new bird object, you need to run, this initialize method will automatically run, and it takes one input. That's what's in the parentheses here, name. So you have to have something there. Now, this in this function, we are going to set some uh, instance-wide variables here, name, sound, flies, and swim. These are kind of the defaults for birds that don't have a further subclass. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to define a new method called attributes. It basically just returns a string uh, that we can later output or whatever um, with the sound, and that's what in Ruby we're allowed to include in our quotes this hash sign, and then open brackets, sound, close the bracket. That actually lets us integrate this variable sound into our string. I am named, let's put the name, and then I can fly and swim variables. Now those could change. <clears throat> Initially, all classes of, all objects of the class bird will have the name that you put in when you first called it, or initialized it. Um, they will get the sound tweet. The variable flies will equal fly, so they'll say I can fly, and swim will equal not swim. So by default, birds cannot swim, and they can't fly. Now we have a class called penguin, which is a type of bird, so it's a subclass. We define a method that changes the variable sound to chirp. It changes the variable flies to not fly. Changes the variable gets uh, swim to swim. Um, similarly with a condor, we change the uh, sound to caw, we change flies to fly, and we change swim to not swim. Now, that actually doesn't change anything on not swim, but it's something we, we could leave out, I guess. Uh, but anyway, the, the point is these variables don't change until each of these methods are called. So let's say we wanted to get the output of a penguin class, which is a kind of bird, um, but we wanted to make sure that we did all these methods first. We, we changed the sound variable, we changed the flies variable, we changed the swim variable. Here's what we did. We'd set up penguin equals new penguin, we name him Martin, and then we output penguin.getSound, so we call the getSound method here, that changes the sound variable to chirp, Get flies changes the flies variable to not fly. Get swim changes the swim variable to swim. And then attributes, which calls this method. So we're outputting at the end because get sound, get flies, get swim, they didn't actually return anything. They just returned self, which means the original object you passed in. We actually do get output from attributes. So it's going to say, Chirp, I am named Martin, I cannot fly and swim. So, um, maybe not the best wording, but whatever, we get the idea. Similarly for Condor, because we run through all these methods before we call attributes, it's going to say, call, I am named Rocky, I can fly and not swim. If we made a bird object that was very generic, um, and we called it Jerry, we just put output the generic dot attributes because he didn't get all these methods. They were from the subclasses. It's just going to output tweet, I'm named Jerry, I can fly and not swim. So <clears throat> what you're seeing here is the ability to call multiple methods in one fell swoop, in one line of code. And when this is useful are things like, let's say I wanted to update multiple, ta or multiple um, different um, tables within a database. Uh, I could call multiple methods in one line, and I could change the sound, I could change the flies attribute and the swim attribute, all before doing a final output. So this is useful for Rails, you're going to see it, and uh, other third-party uh, vendors, you're going to see it. The next thing I want to talk about are some uh, design principles, and this is an acronym that we use called SOLID. The first idea here is that each class should have a single responsibility. Each class should take care of one thing. For example, in Rails, you might have a page class that performs logic for rendering static pages. In our bird example, each class sets attributes for specific kinds of birds. They handle one specific thing. You don't want a class that is so 
general or so widely used that, uh, or so sort of mishmashed together that it does like 10 different things at once. Um, the next principle is the open-closed principle, which says that each, each method in a class should be open to extension by subclasses, um, for example, like we did, but closed to direct modification. In other words, <clears throat> once your basic class is finished, other developers should be able to extend it by either redefining your methods or adding new ones or changing variables, but they shouldn't have to go in and modify your class in order to do so. They should be able to call a subclass. In Rails, for example, all controller classes extend a base controller class that is in the core source files that you really never want to modify because then you're going to break Ruby on Rails and you're going to run into a whole host of other issues if you ever tried to upgrade or work with other, other developers. So in Ruby you have a basic class called controllers and all your individual controllers like a page controller or a customer controller, a user controller, they will all sort of work off of that basic class. They'll all get the same methods from that class and then add their own. The next idea is Liskov substitution. So in our bird example, for, uh, we're going to use that as a starting point just to kind of illustrate this. Pigeon objects should work anywhere where the more general bird object will work in a program without breaking it. So if you extend a method in the bird object with one in pigeon, it should still pass if the pigeon is used as a bird, even if the output is different. So if you rewrote a method from your bird uh, class in your pigeon class, it should return some kind of logical output that makes sense based on what the bird class originally returned. And it should not um, destroy uh, <laughs> sort of that, that call. The next idea is interface segregation, which says that you should not set up a pigeon object that depends on a function that's only available to condors. So we had in our other, uh, our last page example, we had actually, I think it was penguins and condors. Um, so if condors has a method uh, that it uses, uh, we should not have to call condors to make that same method work in the uh, penguin class. In other words, they should both inherit it from a parent class or they should call a separate object and reference that. The next idea is a dependency inversion, which can kind of sometimes seem counterintuitive. But basically what this says is it's okay to allow your lower level classes to rely on higher, higher ones in certain cases. For example, <clears throat> our bird class could rely on an output class that created the message we saw in our last example. We could change that output class or replace it um, or call something different from our bird class that uh, gives a different kind of output. So one kind of output might be HTML, the other kind of output might be XML, the other might be a JSON object. Um, but being able to uh, use these higher level uh, classes in a lower level one can sometimes be advantageous. So, Normally, I would break for questions, but since this is a uh, Google Hangout, we aren't breaking for questions, so you'll have to write them in an email to me. Let's go over eight steps to writing better code. <clears throat> the first thing you need to do is start with an outline. I like paper. If you don't like paper, use whatever you got. Next, start thinking in terms of the data types that you're going to be using. In a lot of cases, in Rails, the case of Rails, Ruby on Rails, um, you're going to be thinking in terms of the tables in your database. So you may have a table for customers. You may have a table for products. You may have a table for comments. You may have a table for blog posts. Um, each of those is going to be its own class or several classes. Next thing you want to do is start researching. These days there's so much open source stuff out there that there's almost no situation when you want to start a project from scratch. Um, there are plenty of like, case studies done. There are people asking questions on Stack Overflow, on Quora. There's all sorts of documentation for um, open and closed source projects that's out there. <clears throat> there are APIs that you can use. So as soon as you have a project and you've started to outline what you need to do, don't look at how you can write things yourself. Look at how you can get something that's already 90% of the way there, 50% of the way there. Even. Next talk through the project or the problem with another person. Now, 
you in a startup may not have access to a whole bunch of other developers. I mean, it may be just you and a couple others, and they may be busy as well. So this can be difficult. But even if you have to talk it out with a non-technical person, somebody who doesn't know how to write a single line of code, walk them through your outline and your data structures and say, does this seem logical to you? Is there a way to do this more efficiently? If there's somebody who's relatively smart and relatively kind of understanding of how uh, a basic code base should work or kind of just how uh, design should work in general or engineering should work, they're going to give you some new variables you didn't think of. So, for example, well, what if the user inputs this invalid string? What are you going to do then? And then you're going to get to write into your outline a new case. Um, talking it out with someone, even non-technical, can save you a lot of headaches once you get into the debugging phase later. Next thing I like to do is write a comment outline <clears throat> where basically I set up all my classes and methods and variables, but I don't actually write all the code for them yet. I just write a comment at the top that says, this will in, you will take the inputs X, Y, and Z and return ABC. Um, and this can help you kind of know where your code is going before you actually start writing. The next step is to start writing and testing each element individually. When you're new at um, a, a new language or you're just new at development in general, one of your biggest problems is going to be poor syntax because you're going to have to look up all the time. What is that? When do I add this dot? When do I use a plus and a quote? And when do I use, you know, there's uh, how do I do a for loop? All these things are, they become trivial as you get better and better and you're more and more experienced, but initially you should be kind of writing an element, a small piece of code, and then testing that individual element rather than writing out 60 lines of code and then saying, okay, let's test the whole thing together. Let's test six methods at once in a class. Because then you're going to have a failure and you're going to have a hard time figuring out where that goes. I really like, um, especially when I was beginning, um, just writing a single function, testing that single function, <clears throat> and then moving on to the next one. Eventually, once you've gotten all of them to pass individually, it's time to start linking them up. And so uh, assuming that um, you don't have problems in the way you link things, if the pieces work individually, they should work as a whole. And then as you have time, refactor, test, and repeat. So in a startup environment, this may or may not be uh, very possible, but um, in most cases, you want to kind of write things out to make them pass, to make them work, and then think about how can you optimize it and then you're going to retest after you've optimized, make sure you get the same output, and then you're going to repeat that process until you've got something that's as efficient as you can possibly get it. And then, you know, if you're at a bigger to mid-sized company, small, well, mid-sized to bigger company, you're going to have code reviews where you're, you're going to get further advice for refactoring, and that's okay, but at least you've done a little bit on your own. Some examples of bad code, and the first one is one of the most common I see with new developers, and that's something that I always guilty of as much as anybody when I first started out are spaghetti strings, which basically means you start out with a simple project in most cases, <clears throat> and it's 20 lines. Well, a new feature gets added, and it now becomes 40 lines. A new feature gets added, and it's now 60 lines. And they're all in one file, and you end up kind of repeating the same pieces of code a couple times because there's an if statement that has the same... Um, sets a couple of variables the same in another else if. Anyway, this means you didn't plan out things well, and it means that you're not taking full advantage of methods and the classes like you should. So watch for long code. Watch for uh, code that doesn't reuse methods. It doesn't create enough methods. It's hard to read. Um, this can also make unit testing nearly impossible. And so you want your code to be modular and not spaghetti. Awkward dependencies are another uh, factor that comes in with new developers, and that's when all of a sudden, in the middle of a class that had nothing to do with uh, something, uh, another class, you have to load it. And so let's say that um, you're uh, writing your bird class, and then within the pigeon class, you all of a sudden have to call condor to get a new method. That's a really bad idea. That means you didn't plan things out well. Um, <clears throat> dependencies should be kind of upstream and not sidestream. 
poor planning is something that comes into a lot of bad code, and sometimes this really isn't 100% the fault of the developer, especially rookie developers, but what you have to assume is that any project will get more and more complex over time, and bad managers, or even decent managers, don't always plan for this, and what they'll do is they'll force you to hack solutions together without rewriting or refactoring. One of the things that I like to do is say to one of my manager, or project manager, or marketing manager, when they give me a new feature request, is what is this feature going to look like in an ideal world in six months? So what that means is if he says, um, hey, I want you to create a login page. Okay, login page, that's simple. I take an email address, password, log the user in, they're authenticated. Boom, that's it, right? And I say to them, what is it going to look like in six months? Or what do you want it to look like in an ideal world if we had unlimited resources? And he says, oh, well, it would be awesome if we could do a password recovery. Yeah, sure, every site's got that. Okay, that makes sense. And then in a couple of months later, we're going to want to do Facebook login, Twitter login. But with Twitter, you can't actually get an email address from their API, so you have to ask for an email address too. So now I've realized this project is not just as simple as two inputs and verify and log the user in. This project needs to be extensible. It needs to be able to change in six months or two months whenever the, the, the requirements change. Ask questions. Ask where a project can be in six months rather than finding it out six months later and having to rewrite your whole thing. The next bad sign for code is repetition. And one of the principles in good code is dry. Don't repeat yourself. If you have to um, use the same methods in multiple classes, <clears throat> ask yourself how you can generalize them and put them into something that is like a dependency, a parent class, or another class that um, each of those can call. Basically, you don't want to, uh, as little as possible, you want to repeat the same code. Unused elements are another um, common thing in, in sort of poorly designed software. So basically what happens is a project grows and an old method or an old uh, class is rarely or never used and then all of a sudden it's just completely used but unused by anybody. But nobody removes it because they're not sure if other people are, might be using it or if it might be useful later. Now, that can be okay to leave it around for a while, but Ultimately, when something isn't used, you don't want to sit there taking up space. Um, so, and if you've got version control in place anyway, you can always go back and look for it if you knew it was in existence six months ago. So there's really not any, feat or any reason not to delete it, assuming you don't break someone else as part of their project. But uh, this happens in front-end CSS where, you know, I make an HTML block and I, I call it the class of Carl's class and I find that in CSS and then um, six months later they remove Carl's class completely and they change the design but my CSS file never gets changed because yeah you know whatever the same thing happens in back-end database tables you'll set up a table for sort of customer product IDs and then all of a sudden the product IDs that a customer bought get moved to a new table but you never delete the old one yeah whatever um, if something is no longer used Try to eliminate it when possible. And the last thing to talk about, and this guy's um, poorly named uh, sex vendor here. So illogical naming is the last thing that developers have to watch for. And that means that um, if you're going to name a function or you're going to name a variable, make sure that it makes sense, not just to you, but to anyone who came in six months later, a year later, and tried to read your code. A great program doesn't need comments. Now, that's debatable, and there's people on both sides of that argument, but the idea is if you can write a program that all the variables and methods kind of are self-explanatory, that's way better than trying to write in two lines of comments for every line of code you have because your names make no sense. So I would ask more questions, but we're on a Hangout, so you'll have to email those to me. Let's make something. So for Startup Institute, um, we, what we're going to be doing is making a Ruby wrapper for the Government Jobs API. And you can see the um, link here if you want to go access that, look at the API documentation. Um, so the reason I'm assigning this project or you know, giving this out is that almost every startup company that I've heard of works with between one and a hundred or a thousand different APIs. APIs are becoming just pretty much standard 
everyday things in programming. And so you should be familiar with how they work. And what an API is, is it's an application programming interface, which means that I can request a website's information by letting my server call their website. That website will return some data in some organized way, and I'm going to parse through that data and either save it to my own database or I'm going to return it to a user in some kind of end fashion. <clears throat> so, for example, um, with a government jobs API, you can call api.usa.gov slash jobs slash search dot json um, question mark query equals nursing plus jobs. That's outlined in their documentation, so if you want to click that link, you can go through and see it. But basically the idea here is you can call a URL on your server call that and bring back some information. Um, that's what an API does. So our challenge today is to make a command line interface that allows a user to type in a query and return a list of government jobs that match that query. <clears throat> For example, I call it the nursing jobs URL that I just mentioned above. It would keep, bring us a list of nursing jobs, but if you don't do anything to it, it actually is very unreadable because it's in JSON, which is a JavaScript object. Um, so it's not something that a typical user would want to read through. But your simple Ruby app that you're going to make is going to return a readable parse string to the command line, so a list format or some kind of uh, puts output. Um, as a bonus, you can generalize your wrapper and allow users to search for other things in the description. So search for locations, agencies, schedules, there's part or full time, anything that you see in that API. Um, documentation above. As a double bonus, save those job results to a database. Uh, so I will leave the specifics up to you if you make it this far, um, but since in the Startup Institute class we only have about an hour, probably won't happen. Don't forget to comment or leave your users some kind of documentation. Try to apply as many of the object-oriented principles that we outlined above as you can reasonably, but you probably don't need all account for errors. What happens when you call an API and there are no results? What if the user who's enter entering the uh, initial query enters an invalid string and it just can't be parsed? What are you going to return back to them? Um, don't be afraid, and actually I would say you almost need to write or use some third-party Ruby gems, um, and if you aren't familiar with installing gems, you should do a Google search and figure it out, but here are some that I would recommend looking into. Nokogiri, N-O-K-O-G-I-R-I. It'll let you easily get HTML elements from um, a page that's returned. Open URI will let you call and pull in external URLs. Um, that could be good for calling that um, the uh, API's uh, URL that we're talking about. And then JSON, JSON, will parse JSON strings like the one that you're going to get back from the government jobs API. That one's pretty much a necessity unless you want to write your own JSON parser, which is not a wise decision. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of ways to solve this problem. So don't worry about optimizing for speed. I mean, initially, with any short-term, quick project, what you want to do is make it work, and then we can refactor it later. We can rewrite it. We can you know, think about optimization. We can talk it out more later. Um, do outline your problem, though, and... Do the necessary research you need to get your solution for each step in your outline. Um, obviously, last thing is don't go search for someone else's library. I think there is a library for this already out there. The point, though, is to make your own, and it's going to be pretty obvious if you come up with some super um, complex library that you wrote in an hour. Okay, so once you're done, um, the last thing I wanted to do in the last few minutes here is just cover some general career advice for developers and non-developers alike. First point is that resumes are almost meaningless. Uh, what does mean something is meeting people. Uh, nine times out of ten, an employer will hire someone who's referred to them by another person within the company or someone they trust over a random guy, even if he has a great resume. Um, the best thing you can do for your career is get out there and go to networking events. There are tons of them for developers, all languages. 
Uh, there's, I probably and Meetup.com is a great way to get out there and do that. Don't be afraid to just start talking to people. Um, we, if, once you do get hired, meet everyone within your organization. Get lunch with your boss's boss's boss just to get to know him. Do everything you can to get FaceTime. Um, next thing you should know is that nobody is going to hand feed you experience. In other words, um, every company wants to see that you've done something, they have some experience, some sort of tangible results before they'll hire you, but you can't get tangible results unless you have some kind of project to work on. It's a catch-22 unless you just start building something. So I'd recommend get your GitHub account set up, start making stuff in your local host, and just, just put it out there. It may be crap, it may be awful, but it shows that you're doing something. Um, and that's that's key. You're going to get into an interview. Somebody's going to ask you what you've done, what you've worked with, what third-party libraries and Ruby you've worked with, and you're going to want to show them that you've done something. The next advice I have is stay in touch with people. There, um, you know, you'll meet if you follow step one. You're going to start meeting a lot of people, but keeping up with them over time is really difficult because a lot of them you're going to see once or twice and then it's done. You know, you're not, not going to run into them all the time. What I've done is, and gotten the habit of doing is having a quarterly contact list where I have about 50 or so of the people I kind of most want to stay in touch with and that list changes over time but what I do is every three months I send a personal email to each of those 50 people and yeah that does take me about a whole Saturday but um, what this does is allows me to connect with them ask them about their families their you know the things we talked about last time what new projects they're working on if they got job, um, what if they've been traveling, just the basics, how's it going. And the goal there is one, to keep in touch with people and kind of uh, make sure I retain old friends, but two, to be honest, it's a little bit selfish, right? Um, I mean, I want to uh, I want to be able to call these people up if someday I'm in dire need of a job, and if I haven't talked to them in six years, it's going to be pretty hard to do that and kind of justify it. Whereas if I talk to them every three months, they know I care enough to spend the time to write them a personal email. They're going to be a lot more open to responding. Next, get a life. And I mean get hobbies outside of development. Now, when you're working with startups, you may have a six or three month period where you are heads down writing code 24-7 or it might feel like 24-7. I mean, I've had plenty of month or two month long stints, three month long stints where I was working 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week, and just getting cranking stuff out. And that that's tough, but uh, my advice is get hobbies besides this. Um, because <clears throat> if you all you're doing is working and coding, you're going to, one, you're going to start losing kind of your ability to connect with people because people are not computers. But two, you're also going to become a very boring person. <laughs> and... Um, you know, you're going to get into an interview someday where you're interviewed by an HR lady who's not technical and she's going to ask you what you do in your free time and if you're going to say all I do is write code, you're going to sound pretty boring and strange. So get something that you do besides code. Even if it's something stupid like playing poker every Friday with your friends or uh, every Thursday you go play a board game or you run by the lake every month. Uh, I mean, I don't care. Just get something else that you do and do that on a regular basis. Get into a habit of doing it. Learn to Google. And if you haven't learned to Google, you'll never make it as a programmer today. I mean, seriously, the answer to almost any question you could ask is out there. You've just got to search for it well. And finally, my last advice to programmers, because I see this done so poorly, uh, is to be aggressive in both getting promoted as well as taking new positions. Um, right now we, we have a mismatch. There are in skills and jobs opening, um, jobs open. There are a lot of jobs open for developers and very few competent good people to fill them. If you are competent and good, if you get to that point where you feel like you are, be aggressive in pushing your employer. Um, now I mean when you're working with a startup you can get some equity that may <clears throat> may help level out the playing field, um, may give you a pretty good upside, but if you aren't getting that, if you feel like uh, you're getting, you know, kind of taken advantage of, remember there are always jobs out there for aggressive developers. So that's what I've got. Um, if you want to send me an email, you have questions about this presentation or anything we do at Packback, feel free, carl at packpack.co, and I'm Carl with a K. 
I'm also on Twitter at Carl L. Hughes. Uh, and I'd love to connect with you. I appreciate you paying attention. If you've watched this whole hour-long uh, intro to code design, I'm impressed. And thank you, and have a good night. <laughs>